This is lecture 13, uh, the first one of block two, and we're going to start getting into biomechanics. So this will be the introduction to that topic. Uh, we'll talk about barefoot and minimalist shoes, minimalist footwear, uh, pronation compared to supination at the ankle, and then the anatomy of the ankle. Uh, but our introduction to biomechanics is going to be about the feet. Uh, we've been talking about specificity of adaptation, and now we'll be shifting into biomechanics, but beginning at the feet, because our feet are where our biomechanics are literally grounded. Uh, and shoes change our mechanics. Uh, our contact with the ground changes. And looking at the anatomy of a shoe, the components that, that impact the mechanical behavior of a foot are the sole and the heel, uh, the upper and the toe box. You don't need to know those things, but you do need to know the difference between minimalist and maximalist footwear. Nobody really calls it maximalist, but by comparison to minimalist, um, the minimal shoes have a thin, flexible sole, uh, just uh, attempting to let your feet recreate natural interactions with the ground. Uh, a maximalist shoe that grips your ankle at the you know like the heel, um, and then you're basically like walking on a cloud. Uh, the the bulk of the shoe industry though is fashion. It's jewelry, but our choice in in that jewelry affects our musculoskeletal anatomy. Uh, the most important difference though uh, is that minimalist shoes recreate a natural gait as though you were wearing no shoes. The, the way we walk barefoot is different from how we walk around in shoes, which is different from how we would walk around in a cast. You know, our gait changes in, in each of these settings and the muscles that contract are different. And specificity of adaptation means we'll adapt to those differences. Um, so why wouldn't we just, you know, be barefoot all the time? Um, if it's if it's better, you know, hypothetically to be barefoot, think like wounds and and bacteria and disease. You know, are you going to go around barefoot in Tijuana uh, or you know San Francisco? It, it helps to have something, some little shield protecting our feet from the world beneath them. Um, but the world isn't newly threatening uh, to our feet. The shoe isn't a new invention. This is a look at the first discovered shoe, the first discovered footwear on the left. Um, 10,000 years ago in Oregon, we have the shoe. Uh, but in the last century, century and a half, shoes have really changed a lot. Um, a century ago, Goodyear, the tire company, uh, made the shoe heads, you know, ped meaning foot, like a pedicure, um, and, and obviously kids. So like kid peds, heads, uh, this half a pair of keds, you know, the, the white shoe there uh, is the photo from the article. Uh, I think they're the actual 1916 models. They might not be, but it's the reference picture that the article provides. Um, and it's a vulcanization when you see that written in there. That's just like latex is extracted from the rubber tree and vulcanizing it is chemically modifying it to make it more durable. Like you add sulfur and whatever, stuff like that. Um, so athletic shoes uh, have been around since the late 19th century. The shoe on the left is a 1900 um Foster Deluxe Spike, and then the image on the right is the 1895 advertisement for it. Uh, but in 2009, the book Born to Run came out, and it cited, I mean, it's pretty like ubiquitously as having a massive influence on the barefoot and minimalist running movement. Uh, so here's our timeline. 
1970, Nike is formed. That's not really the date, um, but it's around there. I mean, technically 1964 um, as Blue Ribbon Sports, uh, but Nike wasn't even big until later. Uh, but in the 1970s, the running boom started. Uh, people were running for pleasure. They were running for exercise. It became a big trend, the running boom. And then shortly after that, these surveys on running injuries started to come out. Uh, the shoes gradually got more padded, more cushioned, more maximal. Uh, then in the 21st century, the minimalist movement, that 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 became marketable, that became um, what, what shoe companies were doing. Uh, and after 2009, tons of people uh, transitioned to minimalist shoes. And we'll talk about what happens after 2009 soon. But first, let's talk about Born to Run. Um, Christopher McDougall, that's the author of Born to Run, said, quote, running shoes may be the most destructive force ever to hit the human foot. Uh, okay, what he's doing is taking Daniel Lieberman's science and sort of like running with it, you know, figuratively. Um uh, Lieberman is a name that's worth knowing. He's a world-renowned researcher at Harvard. Um, and Lieberman's premise is that our ancestors have been running for a really long time for food, right? This is called persistence hunting. Um, essentially, you jog your prey to death. Uh, we humans, we have efficient um, jogging form uh, compared to quadrupeds. Um these quadrupeds, they can easily out sprint us, but, but the gate between a walk and a sprint in think a horse or something like that, they're not efficient. And most animals can't cool themselves nearly as well as we can. We dissipate heat through sweat. Uh, we're horrible sprinters. I mean, near the bottom of the animal kingdom. It's weird that we're so interested in sprinting when we're one of the worst species at it. Um, but we can beat just about every living thing in a marathon, including horses. Uh, so that's the evolutionary explanation for effective hunting is persistence hunting. You jog after the animal, you know, for long enough, uh, and, you know, make sure it stays in the sun and they'll die of a heat stroke. And then you go eat it. You know, we're not chasing them down with bows and arrows and stuff. So that's what persistence hunting is. And the 2 million years referenced is just what the fossil record suggests. Who knows on some level, who cares? As long as we accept that it's a really long time, our ancestors have been running either barefoot or minimalist uh, for a really long time. And then about six decades ago or so, our footwear really started to change. So here's the quotation by Lieberman that McDougal summarized in a misleading way. Um, and to go from Lieberman, who's probably correct, uh, but he may be a tiny bit of an extremist on the subject. To go from that to McDougal taking yeah, extremity to a further extreme, we just have to be cautious uh, in interpreting some of these claims. Um, it's like, you know, what's more destructive than the running shoe? Fungus, right? Or broken glass. Um, distal neuropathies can be really destructive. Lots of things are more destructive than a running shoe. And so it's, again, important that we avoid being fanatics about things because uh, to be a fanatic is to have errors embedded in your reasoning. Um, getting back to McDougall, this is an exact quotation from his book here. He claims, quote, every, uh, every year, anywhere from 65 to 80% of all runners suffer an injury. Uh, that's nearly every runner every single year. Um, and then runners who stretched were 33% more likely to get hurt. Uh, now, we know that stretching isn't helpful. Uh, I'm not quoting him anymore. We know that stretching isn't helpful. And you know, we talked about that in the last section. Uh, but the percentage of injuries, that depends. It depends on a lot. Uh, even if it's only a third 
of runners or maybe half, right? More conservative estimations are probably more realistic, but that's still really high. In between the third and half is still a really high estimation for these injuries. Uh, but McDougall goes on to say that, quote, in fact, there's no evidence that running shoes are any help at all in injury prevention. And this is what he cites. Now, Craig Richards, the author, is an Australian MD who co-wrote The Complete Idiot's Guide to Barefoot Running. So he might not be the least biased researcher to tackle this question, uh, but let's look at his work anyway. Um, Craig et al. Uh, reported that pronation control shoes with elevated cushioned heels, that's very specific, right? Again, pronation control shoes with elevated cushioned heels hadn't been tested in, in controlled clinical trials. That's what he said. Uh, and so if we want an answer to this question, we need to do some more research on it. Um, now, that doesn't mean there's no evidence that running shoes help injury prevention. Uh, we just, we have to consider the scope of the claim here. Uh, misciting science or, or pretending that a narrow sentence is all encompassing can get really dangerous. And a lot of people do this and we can't be counted among them and we have to interpret those claims uh, cautiously. Um, so McDougall goes on to say that, quote, runners wearing top of the line shoes are 123% more likely to get injured than runners in cheap shoes. This claim has problems also. All of these claims have problems. Um, so a little over 4,000 runners filled out questionnaires. And first off, there's a 45% injury rate. McDougall didn't acknowledge that. Um, that it's a it's a fair amount lower than the range he reported of 65 to 80 percent but there was a finding um that the people wearing really expensive shoes experience more injuries than those wearing the cheap shoes if you pause the video and think through this problem um, I bet you can come up with some explanations on why this might be uh, but I'll ex explain it now uh, for people who don't want to wait. The tiny explanation is that the groups weren't balanced, right? It's tough to be confident about statistics run on weird sample sizes, weird group sizes. Um, that's not, we're, we're sort of not meeting the assumption of those uh, stats. But much more importantly, 20-year-olds don't get injured like 50-year-olds do. Um, and, and people who are at risk of injury or who have a history of injury or have postural and gait problems are the ones who are wearing the top of the line shoes. In the 80s, when this study happened, the parents of kids weren't buying them expensive postural correction shoes. Um, and so injury in this study has nothing to do with the shoes. It's about the person who owns the shoes, the person who bought the shoes. Why did they buy those shoes in the first place? That is the finding of the study or at least it should be. That's the real finding of the study. Um, now, here's one. Here's a study that that wasn't in Born to Run. It came out after the book was published, but it looks at 21 previously published studies on pronated foot posture. Um, there are specific foot postures, like pronated uh, gait, that depending on how extreme the deviations are, um, they predispose people to a higher risk of injury. And motion control shoes seem to predispose them to less injury. They seem to be helpful. Here's another study that isn't in the book. Uh, it came out five years after Born to Run was published. And it looks at people wearing neutral shoes, meaning like normal Nikes. That's what they're wearing, normal Nikes. But then also there was a group wearing partial minimalist shoes, Nike's version of minimalism. And then there was a group wearing the Vibram fully minimalist shoes. Um, and the proportion of injuries after training them for 12 weeks in those shoes, uh, which is what the visual is showing here, are that the neutral shoes had the lowest injury rate, which contradicts what, what Christopher McDougall was saying. But, but why are the minimalist shoe wearers getting injured more? Or I guess how, maybe? Are, are the minimalist shoe wearers 
Uh, why are they, how are they getting injured more? And specificity of adaptation, that's the answer. We're not ready for minimalist footwear. You know, maybe according to our genomes, we're meant to be aquatic, but but people who haven't seen water in 20 years are unlikely to be good swimmers. And similarly, we've been wearing shoes all of our lives, you know, day in, day out, everywhere we go, shoes. Our skeletal muscle system, bones and muscles, all of it has adapted to our gait in shoes. And so if we suddenly change all the loads by going minimal, we're insisting that our bones and muscles cope with a totally different profile of stresses. I mean, totally different. And so if we're running the same distance under totally different conditions, we'll get overuse injuries. Just like someone who cycles four hours a day uh, would get injuries if they switched to jogging four hours a day. It's a different stress and it's just specificity of adaptation. We need to give our bodies time to adapt. Um, so let's get back to our timeline what happened after Born to Run, after 2009. Um, tons of people transitioned to minimalist shoes. And then a couple years later, by 2011, that's when the stress fracture reports started coming out. In the 2010s, uh, there was this pandemic of stress fractures. I mean, people had been wearing shoes, like maximalist shoes, for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and then suddenly they changed their gait. Um, and, and, and we don't just adapt to walking or jogging. We adapt to the kind of walking we do. We adapt to the kind of jogging we do. We adapt to our specific gait. We become fit to that gait. And then if we change it, right, we know what's going to happen. We, we can expect what happens next. Um, so by 2013, transition programs started to emerge. Um, yes, I know you run 10 Ks every day, you know, but let's start you off with one Ks for a while in your new minimalist footwear. And then we'll work you up to two Ks and then you get to 3Ks and 4K, and eventually you can have all the Ks you want, but we have to gradually transition to this new load profile. Um, because if you've been in maximalist shoes all your life, you can't just immediately switch fully to minimalist shoes and hope to cover the same distance, uh, endure the same amount of stress uh, without getting injured. And the person who describes this problem best is Katie Bowman. Um, I, I quoted her in the last block, but um, she's written about this topic in several books. One of them is Whole Body Barefoot. I, I hate her book titles, uh, but the sentences inside of those books are great. Um, and so I'll, I'll quote Katie Bowman some more at the end of this lecture, but for now, it's this. As with most arguments, when you examine this one closely, both sides are right and wrong. Research shows that minimal shoes are not safe for everyone in every situation, but research also shows that conventional shoes wreak their own havoc on the body. The element that seems to be missing from the argument is that shoes don't exist in a vacuum. Shoes and feet are in a relationship with the user and the environment, which means the physical outcome of the body that wears the shoes depends on the state of the wearer's foot, body alignment, gait patterns, frequency of movement, and most frequented terrain. A shoe can't be a problem or a solution in and of itself. Um, great passage about it. So flip-flops, are flip-flops minimal? Get that answer in your head because on the next slide, I'm going to provide it. So our flip-flops, even the bottom ones, it doesn't have to be those giant ones. Those little tiny ones, beach flip-flops on the bottom, are those minimal footwear? No, they aren't minimal footwear. Um, no matter how little they weigh, they're not minimalist because you don't walk normally. Uh, you, you do this like weird scrunching of your toes. Look at pictures three and four there. You have to recruit muscles in an unnatural way to keep the flip-flops on. The mechanical inputs 
are different. So remember mechanotransduction from the last block and the specificity of mechanotransduction? This uh, changing mechanotransduction, um, changing those signals, that can result in permanent changes in your anatomy. Uh, shortened toe muscles, less mobility, and, and those changes can migrate up your gait, affecting more than just your feet. And think about healed shoes. <clears throat> These shorten the gastrocnemius. And the gastro crosses two joints, right? It's, it's not just affecting the ankle healed shoes. Um, the hamstrings cross two joints as well, right? They, they act on the hip and the knee. So if you affect one joint through healed shoes or other gait changes or just sitting a bunch with chronically flexed knees, you'll experience postural changes that aren't localized to the individual joint. Um, it's not just your ankle or just your knee uh, that's going to change. But at the ankle, uh, make sure you know the difference between supination and pronation. Similar to supination and pronation in the hand, at the foot with pronation, you're sort of sagging inward. Uh, so a pronated gait is what you see in that center image. And this is something that has been shown to be correctable by footwear. Um, but even this is, is potentially problematic. Um, so uh, evidence is that a highly pronated gait is, is more likely to induce injury and uh, pronation control footwear can help reduce it. Um, but, our, but our feet are meant to balance us. And uh, today balance is a task that's just generally accomplished by the footwear. It's not accomplished by our feet, by our, by our joints, by our, by our muscles because we don't walk and jog on unstable ground. When was the last time you jogged on sand or go into the woods and don't walk on the path? Um, our actual neuromuscular balance is so seldom put to the test uh, anymore. And so let's get back to Katie Bowman. Um, our beautiful, our beautifully uh, complex feet, ankles, knees, and hips have been casted prevented from moving fully. By exposing these joints to the same surface day after day, decade after decade, we have created structures that prevent the full use of our body and have lost the mobility necessary to cope with varying terrain. When we trip on a hole and sprain our ankle, we are quick to blame the whole stupid hole in the middle of this playing field. How dare you appear right where I was walking? A lifetime of picking the roads most traveled and the paths most groomed has basically ensured that our tissues are unable to carry our bodies safely through any detritus nature might throw in our path. The occasional hole is not the problem. Our weakness is. Um, so another good, good uh, summary line by by Katie Bowman there, um, summary paragraph. Uh, so you know all about specificity of adaptation. I put Mike Tyson on there because of contact adaptation, a type of specificity of adaptation, and because he's my favorite athlete. But uh, whatever your shoe is, it will affect pretty much everything upstairs, pretty much everything north of your ankles, uh, in addition to your ankles. But let's look at the ankle itself. There's a lot going on, uh, but you don't need to know every bone and muscle and joint you know, in the foot. Uh, what I want you to know is these two joints, the talocoral joint and the subtalar joint. You don't need to know that the talocoral is superior and the subtalar is inferior, uh, although it would be easy to remember that the sub one is inferior. Um, but the article here has a great characterization of the motions of these two uh, joints. The talocoral is a hinge. Okay, that's plantar flexion and, and, and dorsiflexion on the uh, malleolar axle that's the talocoral joint. The subtalar joint, the inferior one, is your gyroscope, uh, which is a spinning wheel or, or, or disc uh, that moves freely in like multiple uh, directions. So if you're in the woods or on the beach um, or some other you know unstable 
surface, the subtalar joint is getting plenty of work. If not, if you're walking around in normal life, it's probably just your talocurl uh, joint bearing your weight. So when we evaluate gait and look for causes of pain, we're only really looking at the talocurl joint. Um, now, conversations about being more natural in your footwear always helpful uh, because your environment isn't merely shoes. It's the terrain. And that terrain is not natural either. Streets and buildings and houses and gardens and golf courses, these aren't natural. And, and outside of walking, your entire life is unnatural too. I mean, do you have a car? Do you take supplements or medications? Do you refrigerate food and sleep in a bed? Nothing we do is natural. And, and sometimes that needs to be factored into our diagnoses and our therapies. Back to Katie Bowman for this topic. Uh, this is from the book, Move Your DNA from chapter five um, called Transitioning well, and, and the, the subsection there is the surfaces you walk upon. Overground walking is flat ground walking. Most anatomical models of the foot and ankle are based on the foot and ankle movements demonstrated by chronically shod flat walking folks. Shod means you're wearing shoes. When we apply these models to human movement research without qualification, the therapeutic solutions to many injuries and issues wrought by the diseases of behavior continue to evade us. What we know about how humans walk is actually based on how humans walk around in a modern context. If we don't acknowledge that our model of normal walking has nothing to do with nature, our therapeutic options are vastly limited. Okay, one last Katie Bowman slide. Um, how do you sleep? And I don't mean how many hours. I'm referring to the loads created by the position in which you sleep. Have your body's tissues atrophied to the point where they're no longer able to adapt to a mattress or pillow, a different mattress or pillow? This is a sign that the smaller joints in your body have stiffened to the point where doing nothing on a pile of fluffiness is too hard on your body, a la Princess and the Pea. Had you been sleeping in nature, this bedtime adaptation would not have settled into your cells, making you too weak to go without your pillow. Uh, the Princess and the Pea bit is about the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Uh, but the point is, when people sleep in a hotel, they often complain, or they sleep at someone else's house. They often complain, you know, the bed was too hard, the bed is too soft, uh, the pillow was too hard or soft or thick. You know, uh, mattress manufacturers now have a sleep number. You know, if you go camping, uh, you'll like in, in a tent on the ground or whatever, you'll, you'll wake up in the morning stiff and sore, but not if you go camping all the time because of specificity of adaptation. Your body adapts. In, in the case of our adaptations, our bodies are adjusting to comfort. They're adapting to comfort when the tiniest discomfort will then be a painful interruption to our well-being. Um, it's like shaving cream, right? You don't need it unless you use it. So in summary, there's no such thing as a good shoe or a bad shoe. The only question that really matters about shoes are, are those shoes appropriate to the user and appropriate to the environment and appropriate to the goal? Those are the important questions uh, to ask. And um, here's our questions, right? The, the questions uh, that you should be able to answer from this presentation, from this slideshow, you know, what is minimalist footwear? Uh, and then consider something like sandals, consider different types of footwear, and are those minimalist and justify your answer? Uh, runners who want to transition into minimalist footwear, you know, what are some things to consider? Um, Daniel Lieberman and the persistence hunting, know that. Um, the pronated running gait, know a little bit about that. Um, 
And then what's the difference between the talocoral and the subtalar joints? These are what you should take away from this presentation. And I will see you in the next lecture.